blessing upon the carry those caring for little ones or the sick. Be with the children. Bless all of those who are thy children who are not here. We ask for a special gift of thy grace, gracious Father, to work within the heart and mind of Jonathan. The last thing that we want to do is that which is next. But we have learned and keep learning that thou art God, that thou dost perform thy will. And we want all the children of the church to be thy children. But thou dost always say, of such. Not all, and not only. So we pray work by the power, the irresistible power of thy grace to turn him. Bless the children among us. Give them continuing inquisitive minds into the things of thy word. May they learn to love thee. May they see their parents as good examples, but may they always look beyond their parents so that the wounds and the hurts that we as earthly parents give may not hamper their development of their ability to know and understand thee, their heavenly Father. May we care for the siblings that thou hast given unto us, and even though their personalities and their attitudes at time frustrate us, may we nevertheless keep giving, learning that it is in the home, in the greenhouse of the home, that we learn how to be able to exercise ourselves that way later in life. Help us not to retaliate. Help us to see that thou art the God who does judge. And if we realize that thou dost judge, then we don't have to take care of executing judgments on each other. Thou art the God of vengeance. Thou hast said it over and over, just as a reminder to us, who are thy dearly beloved, that thou wilt in thy love take care of us and all those who hurt us thy children. Bless our teenagers. We thank thee for them. We love them. We pray, Father, that thou wilt continue to guide them in their development. They, like all of us, struggle with a selfish nature. May they know their old man. May they identify him when he shows himself. May they resist his efforts to lead them astray and away from thee. May they commit themselves to an earthly life of serving their Savior, who is therefore their Lord. Bless those of us with children, but also bless those of us without children. The way through life can sometimes be difficult as we think of what we think and believe that we're missing. Show us, O oh Lord our God, that in marriage we have the picture, the fullness of it. Bless us so that we may not let our hurts get in the way of our ability to keep serving and loving thee our God. Help us not to question thy wisdom. Help us to serve thee with our all. Bless those of us who are not married. May we know that in our widowhood or as widows and widowers that we are cared for by thee. We thank thee for the church, the family that can help us, comfort, comfort us. Sometimes the pains and the memories are still very, very sharp. 
be near to help and sustain us and may we go to thy word and find out again and again that thou art the God who commands our consolation that thy loving kindness does cheer our day the knowledge that thou art still faithful in that relationship toward us that thou dost care that thou art tender that thou art full of love for us that thou who hast given us Christ will give us surely all things May we know that, and may that always be a source of strength and comfort. Those of us whose desire it is to be married, but are not, may we wait on thee, and may we do that by giving ourselves in the extra time that we have in service of thee. May we not look at children as those in which we can take pride, but rather may we see them as gifts. And when they humble us, may we thank thee and pray for wisdom, the wisdom to show them Jesus and not to get in the way, not to hinder them from coming to Christ. May we show them forgiveness. May they see it in the relationship and the marriage. May they learn about their Savior through us. Bless thy church. Care for every part of her. Bless the churches of which we are a part. Be with thy people who are in persecution. Be with those who are incarcerated. Give thy blessing to those that are with young. Sustain and strengthen them in their special needs. Bless thy children. Forgive the sins of this prayer. We don't say things as we ought. Weakness covers and touches everything we do. And say, even our prayers... Bless, Father, according to the multitude of thy tender mercy. Bless and assure us that that's why thou dost hear our prayer. Because of Jesus. Amen. Let's express our thanks to God in our giving. In the way we give. Giving, first of all, for the cause of the Reformed Witness Hour. And then secondly, for the cause of the Christian rest home. We sing now from a versification of Psalm 69 and found in Psalter number 184. 184. Psalm 69 expresses the suffering that David experienced that very strongly and clearly foretold the suffering of Jesus, especially at the hands of others. Let's sing these stanzas, five, six, seven, and nine. Five, six, seven, and nine. And remember, in that seventh, the reason for the suffering is not his weakness, but rather zeal for God's abode. Our zeal for God is what got David and Jesus into trouble. So four, five, six, seven, and nine.
Let's read from God's Word now, as we find it in Matthew's narrative of the Gospel, chapter 26. Matthew's narrative of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, chapter 26. Several things happened in quick succession. Um, in chapter 23, Jesus very bluntly and powerfully speaks words of woe to the scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites, calls them whited sepulchers and serpents. And then at the end of 23, he foretells the destruction of Jerusalem, which gave rise to the questions of the disciples at the beginning of chapter 24. They were with him privately and they said, tell us when shall these things be and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world. And then all the rest of chapter 24 and chapter 25 are Jesus answering that question. So he just woes and foretold the end of the world. Verse, verse 1 of chapter 26. And it came to pass when Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said unto his disciples, Ye know that after two days is the feast of the Passover, and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. Then assembled together the chief priests and the scribes and the elders of the people unto the palace of the high priest who was called Caiaphas and consulted that they might take Jesus by subtlety and kill him. And they said, not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar among the people. Then we have the incident of Jesus at a feast being anointed by a woman. And then that, now let's go to verse 14. Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went unto the chief priests and said unto them, What will ye give me, and I will deliver him unto you? And they covenanted with him for thirty pieces of silver. And from that time he sought opportunity to betray him. Now, the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? And he said, Go into the city to such a man, and say unto him, The Master saith, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at thy house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had appointed them, and they made ready the Passover. And now you can see from verse 20 that that's the evening, Thursday evening, of, Pass of where Jesus celebrates the Passover. And in the midst of that, he said in 21, while they were eating, Verily I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. And they were exceeding sorrowful, and began every one of them to say unto him, Lord, is it I? And he answered and said, He that dippeth his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. The Son of Man goeth as it is written of him, but woe unto him, unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good that that man, it had been good for that man if he had not been born. Then Judas, which betrayeth him, answered and said, Master, is it I? He said unto him, Thou hast said. And that's when Jesus dismissed Judas. He instituted the supper and then uh, spoke with the disciples, went out into the garden of Gethsemane, in verse 47, while he yet spake, Lo, Judas, one of the twelve, came, and with him a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now he that betrayed him gave them a sign, saying, 
Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same is he. Hold him fast. And forthwith he came to Jesus and said, Hail, Master, and kissed him. And Jesus said unto him, Friend, wherefore art thou come? Then came they and laid hands on Jesus and took him. And behold, one of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck a servant of the high priests and smote off his ear. Then said Jesus unto him, Put forth again thy sword into his place. For all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father, and he will shall presently give me more than four, twelve legions of angels? But how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled, that thus it must be? That same hour said Jesus to the multitudes, Are ye come out as against a thief with swords and staves for to take me? I sat daily with you teaching in the temple, and ye laid no hold on me. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. And here's where our text begins through verse 68. And they that had laid hold on Jesus led him away to Caiaphas the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. But Peter followed afar off unto the high priest's palace and went in and sat with the servants to see the end. Now the chief priests and elders and all the council sought false witness against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Yea, though many false witnesses came, yet found they none. At the, at the last came two false witnesses and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. The high priest arose and said unto him, Answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witness against thee? But Jesus held his peace. And the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said, nevertheless, I say unto you, Hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest rent his clothes, saying, He hath spoken blasphemy. What further need have we of witnesses? Behold, now ye have heard his blasphemy. What think ye? They answered and said, He is guilty of death. Then did they spit in his face and buffeted him, and others smote him with the palms of their hands, saying, Prophesy unto us, thou Christ, who is he that smote thee? So far we read from God's word. It was on Wednesday that Judas met with the elders and Pharisees and they agreed that for 30 pieces of silver he would find a way to betray Jesus. <coughs> but they said tomorrow's the feast day, the first of the feast days, so not yet. Too many people can't do it subtly, can't do it quietly. So wait. But the next night, when Jesus dismissed Judas, and Judas knew that he was found out, then they decided that they couldn't wait. And that they had to capture him publicly and then try him publicly. But they had to do it first as a Sanhedrin, as the ruling body of the Jewish nation. And they had to do it that way first because they did not have the right to execute and they wanted him dead. And so in order to accomplish that goal of him being dead, 
they had to find sufficient reason that Pilate would agree that he was worthy of death. Hence, they tried him in their court with that in mind. What will it take? What charges can we bring that Pilate would agree to his execution? And it's that which is covered in our text. And that's where we see Jesus tried by the church. He was going to be tried by the world, by the powers that be of that day. But before that happens, this trial takes place. And in the public nature of both trials, God makes clear the innocency of Jesus. That's why silent. That's why he held his peace, his innocency. But then secondly, the crookedness and the evilness of the church world and the power of that day. That they would condemn one innocent. Not seemingly innocent, but one that they knew to be innocent. First of all, then, let's look at the participants, and then the proceedings, and then the sentence. The participants, the proceedings, and the sentence. The Sanhedrin was the highest ruling body in the nation-slash-church of Israel. They didn't have a king who would hold political power. The Sanhedrin exercised as much of that power as they could while under Rome. The Sanhedrin consisted of 71 men, elders, scribes. Many of them were priests and especially chief priests. Now, in the law of Moses, there were priests and then a high priest. There weren't chief priests. But the name chief priest came about when the various high priests so irritated Rome that they deposed them from their position. See, the high priest would not only be one who would serve the normal priestly activities, but he also chaired the Sanhedrin. And so in order to make the power of the Sanhedrin decreased, Pilate or anybody else along the Roman chain of power would just depose the high priest. That's why Annas, and usually you were high priest for life, that's why Annas, the father-in-law of Caiaphas, is no longer high priest. He had been, but he had been deposed by Rome. So he is one of the 71 in the Sanhedrin. That was a mixture. Spiritually, you had Pharisees, you had Sadducees. And, and you can know that because when Paul was tried and he saw the mixture between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, he was able by his statement to confound them and make them fight among themselves. Again, the power of the Sanhedrin was very limited by Rome, and especially because they were no longer allowed to give an order of execution and carry it out. Stephen ended up being killed by a riot. It was something the Sanhedrin would have agreed to, but the Sanhedrin didn't make a decision or a ruling and then execute it in the stoning of Stephen. That was simply uh, an activity of riotous nature. So now, as they bring Jesus before them, they've got to find in their charges and in their hearings a cause that a pilot will agree is worthy of execution. Sanhedrin was chaired by Caiaphas, the high priest. Now remember what a high priest was. A high priest was one who was called to execute the compassion of 
the Messiah to the poor and especially the miserable among God's people. That's why deacons are the new dispensational priests. They give compassion and mercy. He sprinkled blood on the mercy seat. But that was the other duty of the high priest. He was the one, the only one, once a year, who was allowed to go into the veil, into the most holy place, bringing the blood of the atonement and sprinkling it on the mercy seat. The high priests, and as well as all the other priests in the old dispensation, also had a calling and responsibility to say, we are forerunners. There's another one coming. The prophets had to do that. The kings had to do that. But also the priests. There's one coming. We are present day pictures of a greater reality that's coming. Look ahead. And we'll tell you when he's here. That was the duty of the high priest. The Sanhedrin is the body that gathers quickly in the middle of the night to try Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus who for three and a half years has been walking freely in their midst, in Galilee, in Judea, in Jerusalem, at the temple, speaking, preaching. He began at the three and a half years ago by cleansing the temple, using a whip to drive out the buyers and sellers and to overturn the tables of the money changers. This week, he did it again without a whip. His very presence this time was sufficient to drive out the buyers and sellers, to cleanse the temple of that court of merchandise because it was to be a place of worship and prayer. They had frequently sent spies to check on Jesus. First, to gain information. Who was he? What did he teach? What, what was he? Later, they would send out spies to try to catch him. Either they would try to trap him with questions, or they made every effort to remember, as it were, write down his statements in order that they might find contradictions, that they might find weaknesses, that they might be able to diminish his authority. But he spoke so authoritatively and he conducted himself so carefully and graciously that they could never find fault with him. In fact, he in his presence with his words and actions intimidated them. Already the very first time he cleansed the temple, the very beginning of his ministry, was the occasion for Nicodemus to come to him at night and say, you do works that nobody else can do. And nobody can do what you do, except they be sent of God. That's the way Nicodemus had began his conversation with Jesus. Now, they were fed up. They had had enough. Their displeasure with him reached its highest peak six months before now. That was when Lazarus was raised from the dead. That's when his popularity hit its highest. That's when Caiaphas said, the whole world is following him. And that's when Caiaphas was used of God to prophesy, one man must die lest the whole nation perish. But they couldn't do anything. <coughs> Today is Thursday night and Friday morning. Sunday, first day of the week. Sabbath, remember, is on Saturday. First day of the week, Jesus made his royal entry 
according to Matthew 19, 47 and 48, that served as an incentive for them to once again draw the conclusion, it's him or us, he's going to die. Then when he spoke on Tuesday, the woes against Jerusalem and foretold the destruction of Jerusalem and of the temple, that did it again. He's got to die. And then Judas came later that day, Wednesday. <gasps> Nothing better. This is the break we need. But we're going to have to wait. The feast day is tomorrow. First of the feast day is tomorrow. Let's wait. And then when Jesus dismissed Judas Thursday evening, and he races to their palace, all of them are scattered in their own homes commemorating the Passover feast. They get enough together to get a public, to make a public arrest. And then they've got to have a trial. And they begin immediately. As soon as Jesus is brought into the court of Caiaphas, into the palace of Caiaphas, it's called, he is directed immediately into the room where Annas held his court or office. Annas was deposed. He had been high priest. He's not anymore. But they needed to buy time. And they needed some preliminary hearing. They needed to buy time to have the other members, the 71 members of the Sanhedrin, be gathered from all around Jerusalem. But they also needed, what can we get against him? What can we say so that Pilate will condemn him? The proceedings <coughs> violated several of the Sanhedrin's own rules. Justice is to be public. And in the daytime, it's an exercise of light, not of darkness. So they were supposed to hold their meeting in public and in the daytime. They did it right away, through the night. What can we find to charge him? They quickly realized that they can't come up with anything. And so then they start going into the streets of Jerusalem and finding the people who would be yet awake, or waking some up, who would be willing to lie for some money? So they bought men, they paid men to lie. Their rule, God's rule, was a charge could be heard, not in the mouth of the one being charged, he may not and cannot condemn himself. It has to be in the mouth of two or three witnesses who are heard separately and that they agree separately. They bring the same, they witness the same fault or sin or crime and they describe it the same way but separately. They can't be together, otherwise it's obvious that it's in cahoots. No, they've got to be separate, and they've got to bring the same charge. So they start buying people to lie. And I don't know if it was the nature of the people that they found in the middle of the night, but they couldn't get anybody to agree. Nobody could say the same thing that another liar had said. And all of their proceedings are starting to crumble. 
Finally, they do get a charge, they think. And the charge is that he said, verse 61, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. Whether it was the incident of the cleansing of the temple that had taken place earlier on Monday or Tuesday of this very week, we don't know. But these words of Christ are found at the first cleansing. So this is something that Jesus said three and a half years ago. And it certainly must have resided in the memory of some elders, Pharisees, scribes, very, very clearly. Well, somewhat clearly. They remembered that he said, well, did he say I'm going to destroy the temple and build it in three days? No. They got it all mixed up. Jesus said in John 2, you destroy this temple and in three days I will build it up. Speaking of his body. You destroy this temple. You destroy me. And in three days I will build it up. I will arise from the dead. But their charge was. He said he would destroy. Whether it's before Annas. And then later on before Caiaphas. Nothing is working. Nothing is holding water. Nothing will work. And Jesus remained silent. He held his peace to their consternation and frustration. But in holding his peace, he showed that he was innocent. And he showed that they had nothing that they could really charge him with, and they knew it. And the longer he was silent, the more they realized, we don't have anything. Finally, completely frustrated, Caiaphas uses his office to put Jesus under oath. I adjure thee by the living God, that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. The high priest was the one who was to be compassionate and show mercy. The high priest was the one who was supposed to bring the blood of the atonement. The high priest was the one who was supposed to be foretelling and pointing ahead to the Lord Jesus. But Caiaphas was corrupt. Caiaphas was more interested in holding his office and his position. And so now, in this capacity, he raises this question. I adjure thee by the living God. He put him under oath. Tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. A charge or a question that really was not necessary. A charge that was superfluous because it was most evident as Jesus had said earlier to the scribes and Pharisees and as it's recorded in the book of John that all his works and words had demonstrated so that when he asked them, whom do you say that I am? And will you too leave me? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. To whom else shall we go? Thou alone hast the words of eternal life. His sheep knew it and didn't need proof. The Sanhedrin would never know no matter how much he said or how long he talked. So he answers, put under oath, 
The other narratives, as you put them together with this one, seem to indicate that he didn't answer right away. But then he did. And he answered, Thou hast said. But he's not finished. Nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Jesus knew what his appearance was like. He came in the likeness of sinful, weak flesh. He looked like any other Jew. He looked like all of them. He knew what his appearance was. But he also knew what his words sounded like and what his miracles did. He knew the proof was in his works. And if you read John 6, he says it over and over. My works demonstrate. My works show. My words make it obvious and evident. <coughs> and even just in the garden. Whom seek ye? Jesus of Nazareth. Yahweh. Jehovah. I am. I am. The Messiah. I am the Son of God. Many times in the course of his ministry, he called God publicly, my Father. I go to my Father. My Father and I are one. <clears throat> so he adds, knowing his appearance, may contradict or seem to conflict with his statement that he is, he adds this. Henceforth, and that's what that hereafter really means. Henceforth, from now on, you're going to see the Son of Man sitting in the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. When God's people have been persecuted, and the world thinks that they've won and they burn someone at the stake or they imprison them, then that which is often said as it's recorded out of the mouths of martyrs, but it's often always thought by God's people in the midst of some persecution is something like this. You may take my life, but you can't touch my soul. You may take my life from this world, but my God has prepared for us a city. You may destroy the tent, but God will give me a body that will last forever, a building that is eternal in the heavens. Jesus does this, and that's why God's saints do what they do. Jesus said, from now on, you're going to see me die in a couple of hours. Remember how Stephen said it? I see the Son of Man at the right hand of God. In that testimony, in the testimony of all of the apostles and disciples as they preached, they always preached the resurrected and ascended Lord at the right hand of power is the position of lordship. When any one of those 71 members died, they immediately saw him in all his power. at the right hand of power. They saw him sitting. And Jesus wanted them to know that that was not just some future vague prospect, 
but it was a reality that he held for himself in his own mind. Remember, the Mount of Transfiguration, six months before, was crucial for Christ because it gave him a foretaste of that which would come after the sufferings and he could endure the sufferings in anticipation of what he tasted, foretasted on the Mount of Transfiguration. I, he is telling them, am able to endure your false accusations and your wrong condemnations because you don't destroy me. Not really. I am destined for the right hand of power. And you're going to see me coming again in the clouds of heaven, in the glory of heaven, with the affirmation and support of God himself. You want to know whether I'm the son of God? You're going to see it. You're going to see it from your places in hell. As you experience the wrath of God, you're going to see it and anticipate when, he come, when I come again. And that's when you're going to say to the hills and to the mountains, cover us and hide us. Because you will know that your condemnation is sure. You may be able to take my body. But I know it's coming. His answer is described as blasphemy by Caiaphas. The church of that day was expecting the Messiah. Are you the Messiah? I am. And they react in a supposed horror, holy horror. And they begin spitting and hitting. And that's when Caiaphas, in his holy horror, tore his clothes. God used Caiaphas at the time of the resurrection of Lazarus to make a prophecy. The office of priest became prophetic. When he said, it is better that one die than that the nation perish. Now, in tearing his clothes, his royal priestly robes, as if in horror, he is again prophetic. Remember, children, that when Jesus died, something else tore. Do you remember? At the moment that Jesus died, there was an earthquake. And the veil of the temple, something 30 feet high, three basketball hoops high. No man could tear it. And if men tore it, they would have to tear it at the bottom and then all the way up. This time, it tore from the top to the bottom. Jesus died, God tore the veil. And now there wasn't any more separation between the holy place and the most holy place. It was all one room now, not two rooms. In tearing his robes, he declared, I am the last high priest because the real one is here. He didn't know he was doing that. But God was using him. Then he led the real high priest to the altar where his blood of atonement would be sprinkled before the face of God. He didn't know what he was really doing. Psalm 2 tells us the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing. 
and that they take counsel against the Lord Jehovah and against his anointed. They did. They raged in their frustration, in their holy horror. They imagined vain, empty things. But while Caiaphas didn't know what he was doing, God was using him. God was accomplishing his purpose. God was making it abundantly clear to everyone who would ever read about it afterwards. That one they tried was innocent. Unworthy of the accusations and the condemnation they placed on him. They didn't condemn him because witnesses were brought. They didn't condemn him in the light of day. They didn't even condemn him for what he did. They condemned him for who he is. The Messiah, the Son of God, But he was the real high priest. And silently, humbly, knowing God's purpose, he let them condemn him. He let them nail him. He shed his blood and he laid it out on the seat of mercy, earning mercy for us. Know that he who died did not die because he was worthy of it. He who was condemned wasn't condemned because he was guilty. But he was condemned because he represented us. And we, as members of the church, are the ones who are guilty of condemning him who is innocent. But he bore it, and he walked that way, and he laid himself. And then he declared, blessed are they that trust in him. Trust him. His innocency is now your innocency. We may not appear innocent. We know what we appear like. And that's not just an appearance. That's a reality. But by faith. Trust. We know we're forgiven. And righteous. And no man can take our crown. And no man can condemn us before him. Who can lay a charge against one of God's elect? Blessed are they that trust in him. Amen. Our Father, we thank thee for that gift, for that salvation, for that hope that is ours because of what he endured for us. We thank thee and praise thee. Bless us now. Forgive our sins. We, we sin here too. We sin always. But we can know our innocency in Jesus. And we look ahead to the day with increasing eagerness when we can stand in righteousness at last and thy and his glorious face shall see. What a day that will be. Amen. Let's sing from number 389. 389. taken from Psalm 143, again describing 
the activity of condemnation. The enemy has sought my soul in dust to tread, to darkness I am brought. But revive my fainting heart, my soul from trouble take. Let's sing these stanzas, two and six, stanzas two and six of 389. Jehovah bless you and keep you. Jehovah make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And Jehovah lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.